All right, we are setting one of the larger rocks on the project right now. You can see we've got the skidster over there and to be able to lift this rock, you can see the strap and the boom and that kind of stuff. And what this is gonna do is this is going to set the back edge behind this frame rock of this waterfalls here. The thing I love about using these enormous rocks is it just sucks up an entire edge very, very quickly and it just makes a, a really big statement. But what it also does is it requires a little bit more work and preparation because of the size of the boulder. You don't wanna be moving this thing in and out, in and out, in and out because of the weight of it. And it's cumbersome because of the size of the machine, that kind of stuff. So it's important that you do your due diligence and proper planning before setting some of these very large boulders. So you're only moving this rock ideally one time. interesting rock that's just gonna be that wash of cobbles kind of blasting through all that stuff backfill that with gravel we got to get a cantilevered rock kind of coming out over that to stabilize that log to keep that from floating and then once we start layering that in we want to kind of create a staircase effect so we're gonna have two waterfalls coming in over here so we have this incredible stone that just sets the stage for everything lines up you know it's just it dominates and it's also setting the back elevation for our wetland so we want to have asymmetrical waterfalls so I like working in rectangles you heard me say this before so i like either tall narrow waterfalls or short wide ones so just big rectangle type things so this one i'm almost thinking a wide fall and maybe two or three falls cascading down lots of sound lots of oxygen when we're talking about a recreational pond we want to have high dissolved oxygen we also want to have that big push of water over on the other side, I'm thinking a tall, skinny waterfall dropping down. So back over in here, we're gonna have a wash of those cobbles kind of coming through, just like you would find in nature. You go up into the mountains, you're gonna have big giant boulders on either side of your waterfall. And then at the base of those falls, it's usually just this mixture of all the different types of boulders and things that have been washed downstream. Wedge behind boulders and stuff like that. So we'll have all these rocks just kind of blasting through this. Another interesting looking rock right here, barely above water level. So just a little bit above water level right here. I'd love to have some water behind it. Big tall fall back in here. We want to hide that joint. This one rock is going to be very important because it's going to help to shelter that. We will need to get something else back behind it. Then back over on this side, we have to get another large rock transitioning back down. So again, I love the look of these big blocky stones, but we also still have to transition our way back down to water level. We need to transition back down just because of elevations. Again, mimicking nature. Um, we have to slowly soften our way. So that could be done a couple different ways. It could be a staircase type of an effect or it could be a large rock kind of pitching itself down. So again, we'll play around. We'll go take a look at what we have. Once we get these done, then we can start focusing on the wetland filter. Okay, so last part we checked in with the video was we were setting this log and then we had started talking about the waterfall area that was coming in through here. As you can see, there's been a series of rocks that have been placed with the intent of building this main waterfall coming into the pond. It might be deceiving and it was actually tricky for some of us as we were kind of standing back and looking at the rocks and trying to determine where water level was. But water level for the pond is actually right about here. So this rock will be completely submerged in water. Right now, this boulder feels enormous sitting the way that it is with no water in the pond and for a variety of reasons. But the effort is going to be large frame rock here, one that's a little bit lower. We'll get probably a eight inch waterfall, nice and wide back here. And then we'll just do a double drop. So we'll have another waterfall directly behind behind it, probably at a little bit different of a angle, the way the waterfall falls, but this rock right here will double up as a frame rock for two waterfalls. So there will end up being another frame rock back behind this framing out that top waterfalls. And if I'm correct, this will establish the elevation for our wetland filter, which is going to be built just back up behind this. There is also going to be water coming in through this side. So this is a split waterfall rock right here. So this frame rock is actually the most integral piece of the waterfall because it not only is it framing out the two waterfalls here, but it's also splitting the water coming down and through here, which will probably look either more like a horsetail falls or something a little bit more narrow and like a tributary type thing. And this will be a little bit more water over here and more aggressive. All right, 
We are setting one of the larger rocks on the project right now. You can see we've got the skidster over there and to be able to lift this rock, you can see the strap and the boom and that kind of stuff. And what this is gonna do is this is going to set the back edge behind this frame rock of this waterfall is here. You wanna be able to give yourself that flexibility to be creative and get the angle that you want for it. Make sure you excavate for the proper depth, so on and so forth. So have a vision or a plan in mind when using these big boulders. It just makes your life so much easier to do all of that initial prep work, which we just did by over excavating all this area. We actually did this entire edge with the intent that we're gonna come in here with some of these massive rocks. So we just went ahead and over dug everything so that we could just start slamming rocks in place. And that's the beauty of working with the EPDM liner is it's flexible, it's malleable, we can move it back and forth, back and forth. Once those rocks are set to be able to backfill behind them and that kind of stuff. So I love using the EPDM is because we can really manipulate the shapes of the ponds and really carve these things in and giving it that wonderful shape. So Ed's gonna come over here and he's gonna go ahead and set this big rock. Ed, I was talking about why it's essential to kind of do your due diligence and the proper planning when moving exceptionally large boulders or the big boulders on the project because our audience can see how cumbersome it is using some of these machines, that kind of stuff. And that's sure. a big reason why we over dug this whole area knowing that we're gonna be dropping in some of these massive rocks. So I kind of touched on it, but we're just kind of now setting that shape, right? Correct. Along the back edge, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, exactly. So the excavation was done. Excavation for us is a guideline. So what we did was we kind of roughed everything out. Once we start getting some of those base boulders, we always want to let the rocks talk for us. So by having that extra liner, starting with that lower section, which we knew that was a given spot. The top edge could be more fragmented. Now what we do is we can fold the liner in. Once we pick out the rock, we could measure it. We can know exactly how much room we need. We can know the height, the depth, all that stuff. Now we can come in, dig that material out, put the liner back in place. Again, this is slow. I mean, it's your, where each rock is individually pieced and carved into position. It's not like we're just digging a hole and then just randomly boom, 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 dropping in rocks. We want to let the rocks talk for us and we can manipulate everything. So it really kind of gives that flow that we're looking for. You know, when we're talking about naturalistic water features, I think that's the name of the game. Having those rocks kind of extend out beyond the area, creating little plant pockets, tying into seat walls, having different grade chains, all those little subtle things will make all the difference in the world. And that's what it's about. And I think what's also really, really neat about this is you can scale it down. We're using the same system that we use on our four by six, seven by nines, eight by 11, 11 by 16s, all of our pond kits. It, everything is, is going back to that very simple system with the 20 products and 20 steps. We're just doing the same thing over here, just much on a much larger scale. The rocks are bigger, the equipment that you need is a little bit more specialized, but we're still doing the same thing. So again, understand that this is a very simple process. We just have to follow the steps and use the products that are created to help create these decorative water gardens. And it just looks incredible. So I'm gonna put the camera down and help give Ed a hand. the grade has been raised up significantly so we've eaten up a big portion of that pile that we had back behind the guys and brought it in over here to create elevation for the wetland filter this is going to be the rough layout of the aqua box we'll have a snorkel and two centipedes in here as well so ed explain real quick why we're setting up the configuration of the aqua box the way that we are just in the event that or with the thinking behind it, how the rest of the water feature is going to tie in yep. with the wetland filter so we have a couple different things that we're working with here one we have obviously the back edge of the pond and then we also have this, this structure that's going up I'm actually standing right on the edge of this wall so what we did was instead of making the wetland with four aqua blocks wide which is normally what I try to do so that's gonna give us good water distribution great filtration everything what we did was we lengthened it up and we took that four throw off so now we're only doing three aqua blocks but we added on two to the other end so and that will we'll end up with the same volume of filtration we just kind of changed it around that's what I like about stuff whenever we're designing and building I love having flexibility so working with a modular type system that we've created working with the snorkel the centipede the aqua box we can cut and paste and we can reconfigure things according to the different site parameters and it's exactly what we're doing here solid wall on one side that's already been established for that waterfall new walls going here we have to change it like this otherwise I mean we do have other options we could slide it all the way
way that way but then it's going to start spreading stuff out and it may take away from some of the other planting areas remember this the whole idea of this recreation pond is not only for the homeowners but it's also for all the animals and for the different plants and things that they want to put in here so we don't want to utilize the entire space with water as much as i would like to we want to try to balance it out we want to have enough water to create the desired effect still have all those unique spaces in and around it to create that look that they're going for so with that holistic approach that you're taking on designing you know the way the wetlands fitting in with the overall design and yep. again taking into account the planting space the gathering spaces the surface area of water that kind of stuff for a pond like this or can you just give me a baseline as far as sizing a constructed wetland as a biological filter so for a recreational style pond you should be 25 percent on the minimum side and up to 50 percent of the surface area of the pond so the smaller the pond is the higher the percentage is and that's because a larger body of water is more stable so it's kind of like an inverse relationship so it's a little bit funky we do have some charts and tables available we also have an incredible tech team which trevor is a part of right over here so he can Bam. assist you know with all those designs and things like that to make sure it's done properly so we do take a lot of different things into account again this one we're having a structure going over it so it's basically going to be an indoor pond basically so we're going to have airflow going through it but we're not going to have all the leaf debris so leaf debris coming in even though we have intakes and things like that that's what's going to pollute the water that's what's one of the things that's going to cause problems so we could actually manipulate that size a little bit given some of that extra information so again recreational ponds higher surface area higher filtration if this was a traditional koi pond this wetland would be half of this size and it would be more than enough but again there's different requirements that are necessary for people to get in the water versus just fish <laughs> Centipede runs underneath the aqua blocks. That is the roughed in version of a wetland filter. Next, we are going to come over the top of all these aqua blocks with these four to eight inch cobbles. Then we'll size down a half size to kind of that three to six inch cobble. And then we'll come in with this larger river stone over the top of that. Um, you can see we've already got some water going in it in order to fill it at least to the top of the aqua blocks to get some weight in here. When we dug this down, the trough that ran right down here that the centipede occupies started to get a little damp. We don't want to battle the groundwater that you guys saw when we were remediating that with our relief pipe that went out to the sump pit over there. So we don't want this thing to pop up out of the ground while we're gone. So we're gonna fill this with water in order to stabilize that hydraulic pressure from the water underneath the liner. But we made absolutely incredible progress. Sean, Mike, Sammy, Nick, Jax, Jason, of course, all did a fantastic job. The whole Earthworks gang did an absolutely outstanding job of getting the site ready and then having everything else that we would possibly need at the ready including four excellent lunches and a couple good times in the evening. So they were incredible hosts. You can see Ed back behind me filming for his channel, Ed the Pond Professor. If you haven't checked out his channel, please do so. It's incredible. You could tell just by watching our video what kind of an educator he is in the world of water gardening and everything that has to do with ecology and ecosystems. So please check him out. Listen, it's Chris, Trevor, wherever he's at, he's back there. But this is Chris at Team Aquascape signing off for this latest episode of Team Aquascape. The prep work has now been done. The groundwork is set and ready to go so that when the 50 plus CACs, that certified aquascape contractors come in here in a couple weeks for the event that we're hosting alongside with Jason again and Sean and the rest of the Earthworks gang as a build a pond, an advanced build a pond day, everything is ready to rock and roll. We'll see you back and hopefully we'll be able to fill or show you the finished product at that time. Until then, we'll see you later.